All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we're going to continue our study of the Dharma. We're going to continue studying and looking at the sutra that we've been, we've been reading for a while. Uh, but before all of that, let me introduce the theme for tonight. So I wrote it down. So the word or the idea, the theme for tonight is, let me get the glare away. So Buddha Tathata, translated as true suchness or true thusness, real thusness. It, <laughs> it's a big word and it's a big idea. Um, in many ways, it's the biggest idea. Um, so I'm going to kind of give a little bit of an introduction to this big idea, um, but I'm actually going to kind of mainly allow the sutra to speak for itself tonight. Um, I'll, I'll say probably a few things about the language, about the, the actual word and what it means. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, we're going to dive back into this sutra and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but yeah, let me just talk a little bit about this word. So again, it's a big word, two parts, uh, butta and tathata. Tathata, we have definitely, we've mentioned, or I've mentioned this word a lot in the Dharma doors. And the second part of it, tathata, suchness, thusness, as it is, as it isness. That's an idea I've spoken about, um, but this larger compound idea of Buddha Tathata, uh, I certainly haven't done a whole night on it, a whole Dharma talk on it. So again, it's a word in two parts. And what's interesting is, is that linguistically speaking, right away, you, you might notice that the word Buddha, very close to the word buddha like buddha <laughs> and they are actually etymologically related but buddha just well not just <laughs> it means truth or reality in a way of something being true or real and then tathata that second part of it again it's about this idea of thusness and both of those ideas, <laughs> truth, reality, and this idea of suchness, both of those ideas are, <laughs> they're big ideas. You put them together <laughs> as one idea, and oh my gosh. I mean, in many ways, we are talking about the ultimate, the what the Buddhists would call Paramartha, the ultimate truth, the highest meaning. Um, it's, I'm not going to be able to say much about it. I'm going to let the sutra speak for itself. It's going to talk about it, going to describe it. I think the one thing that I'll say going into the sutra tonight, that at least to kind of create a mood, a way, a way to feel about this, maybe, I... I teach this idea of tathata a lot. It's, it's what I'm, one of the Buddhist ideas, the Mahayana Buddhist ideas that I'm, I'm really into. And what the way that I describe it is it's sort of a complement to this teaching of emptiness. And we're, we're going to talk about emptiness tonight. We usually do. But the idea is, is that well, we sort of start out thinking things are really, really existent, really, really happening the way we think they're happening, you know, really real in that sense. And then we come to an understanding of emptiness, the empty nature of all phenomena. And there's a way in which all phenomena, small and big, material, immaterial, all phenomena are empty. 
And so this sort of evac evacuates all phenomena of an inherent existence. And so there is this emptying, this emptiness. Tathata, Buddha Tathata, is sort of what I describe as the fullness. And it's a fullness when you sort of come back to the world of phenomena with an understanding of emptiness, with an understanding of the empty nature of all phenomena. So you could provisionally think of tathata, buddha tathata, the subject for tonight, you could kind of think of it as the next step beyond emptiness, <laughs> if, we, if, there, if we could conceive of such a thing. So on that note, let me begin to transition to the sutra that we're looking at. So we've come a very long way on this sutra. Again, this sutra is called here, the Manjushri Bhutta Kshetra Guna Vyuha Sutra, the array of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha realm or Manjushri Bodhisattva's Buddha land. So that's the name of it in Sanskrit and from the Tibetan translation. Uh, we also have an, another English translation from the Chinese. And as many of you know, we're reading both of those to kind of kind of coordinate or triangulate a meaning, a deeper meaning of the text. And I'm not going to go through the whole narrative of the sutra up to this point, but I will remind you of kind of one basic idea. This sutra, as the title suggests, is all about Bodhisattva Manjushri, this Bodhisattva of wisdom. It's what this Bodhisattva represents, is this pranya, this transcendent wisdom. And Manjushri has uh, been answering questions from another Bodhisattva, this Bodhisattva uh, lion courage, thunderous voice. And they've been going back and forth. And I want to remind everybody that the first question that the Bodhisattva asked Manjushri was, when will you attain Buddhahood? When will you attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? In other words, your Buddha land, like the perfection of your Buddha land. When is that going to happen? When will you achieve complete enlightenment? And the Bodhisattva Manjushri answers that question in a very interesting way, but ultimately says, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going for that. I'm not going to get enlightened in that sense. But what do you mean? Like, of course you are. And Manjushri gives a kind of an answer, and I could kind of go through that answer, but we're going to kind of talk about it again. So, but the long and the short of it is that Manjushri, in speaking about the mind that would be enlightened, that mind is nowhere to be found, he says. So what mind is there to become enlightened? And so that sort of negates this idea of the future in that sense. Then the Bodhisattva, lion courage, thunderous voice, asks Manjushri, when did you first generate this bodhicitta, this mind to become enlightened? When did you generate it? In other words, we're thinking about the past now. And the Bodhisattva Manjushri gives a very similar, actually he kind of avoids the, the question altogether, at which point the Bodhisattva asks the Buddha and the Buddha says, yeah, Man Manjushri is too smart to answer that question, basically. He's too profound. So I'll answer for him. 
And so last week we heard the Buddha describe this, this wild story that happened a long, long time ago in like a whole other universe. And there was a king and the king decided to become a, a Buddha. And that king is Manjushri. Wild stuff, very wild story. But all the while, Manjushri doesn't say when in the past he generated this bodhicitta, this determination for enlightenment. And that brings us to tonight, where the question will be about the present, about the, pre like the present moment in that sense. And yeah, I want to, yeah, I don't think I need to really say anything. I guess, yeah, let me say this going into it. I think this will just be interesting. So if tonight starts to get a little too out there, we're going deep into this tonight. And if it starts to get a little too wild, I want to just remind everybody that there's kind of a really just simple way to be thinking about this. And it's sort of about your practice, one, one's practice, my practice. And it's sort of this idea of, well, you could call it progress, this idea of like getting somewhere and this idea of like, you know, becoming enlightened in that sense. So the idea is, is that maybe, maybe regarding your practice, you have this idea that it's like leading somewhere and, and maybe, you know, maybe you're not going for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, maybe you're not going for complete perfect enlightenment, but the idea is, is that if you're practicing meditation, if you're practicing Buddhism in that sense, you maybe have some idea of where this is going. Well, what are the benefits of all of this? So you could, I could ask you, Bodhisattva, when are you going to get there? When, when are you going to complete the path in that sense? And even just beginning to think about it that way, one starts to kind of especially if you are practicing Buddhism, if you are thinking about the Dharma, all you, you, you too might start to think, huh, that's a really strange way to think about all of this. <laughs> and then we could also think about this. When did you begin? When did you begin this practice of yours? <laughs> And, you know, the idea is, is like, oh, would it make any sense to give you a specific day, a specific time, a specific moment when this started? Again, it starts to kind of lose meaning in a way when we really think about these questions. So tonight is now about the present. And I do need to remind you of one wild thing that came up. There was a lot of wild things that came up last week when we heard all about Manjushri's origin story, like where Manjushri came from. And one of the things that it said, and I, don't, I won't go looking for it, um, it was about how this king who makes the vow to become a, a Buddha and this king, then we are told, we are told this by the Buddha. The Buddha says, oh yeah, that king, well, after kalpas and kalpas and kalpas, he achieved the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena. And then actually after kalpas and kalpas and kalpas, he perfected or completed all 10 stages of the bodhisattva path actually attained all 10 powers of a Tathagata and is complete in all Buddha Dharma. <laughs> so <laughs> that right there is where tonight begins. So I'm going to read um, 
I know that we have the uh, the Tibetan version. The Tibetan version is online at 84,000.read. But tonight I am read, going to read primarily from the Chinese version. It, it reads a lot cleaner. Actually, I'm going to be reading a little bit, I think, even from my own translation. But just so you know where all of this is coming from. So after all of that, <laughs> Lion Courage thunderous voice bodhisattva is scratching his head thinking and lion courage thunderous voice asks manjushri venerable since you've already fulfilled the 10 bhumis or the 10 bodhisattva stages and have fulfilled the 10 powers of a tathagata and you're completely perfect in all Buddha Dharma. How is it that you haven't achieved Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? <laughs> in other words, how is it that you are presently not then a Buddha? It's, it sounds like you are in that sense, right? So Manjushri's first answer is it's very complicated but basically he says something like this he addresses the bodhisattva noble one there is no further realization of awakening having already perfected all buddha dharma how so being already perfect there's no need for further realization. All right, so this is where it's about to start to get very tricky. And I say that because the lang, you know, when it comes to Manjushri, the words are so important, meaning the exact words. And I have to tell you that uh, these other, the, both of the translations, they sort of, they do a little, they miss a few couple of key points. And it has to do with this answer about everything or all dharmas, this idea of completely perfect in all Buddha dharma. And then this thing that Manjushri says about, so being already perfect, there's no need for further realization. And then Lion Courage Thunder's voice asks, how are all Buddha Dharma perfect or perfected? Yeah, uh, the other, this version is, the question is, how, are, how can one achieve perfection in all Buddha Dharmas? The other one, I'm not sure, but what is, the, what is this all about? <laughs> the perfection of all Buddha dharmas. So, you know, this is a lot of interpretation that's about to happen, but so in general, Buddha dharma is the, are the teachings of the Buddha. Things like the eightfold path, the seven factors of enlightenment, so on and so forth. The teachings of the Buddha, the bait, all of the dharma in that sense, that's all Buddha dharma. So in general, to be completely perfect in all Buddha Dharma is to basically have walked the Eightfold Path and have fulfilled the Eightfold Path, having developed the seven factors of enlightenment and being developed in the seven factors of enlightenment and so on and so forth. All of these different Buddha Dharma the idea of perfecting them, being perfected in them, being perfected in morality, being perfected in meditation, being perfected in all of these things. So Manjushri says, if, if one is perfected in all of those Buddha Dharma, then there's no further, there's nowhere further to go. Otherwise, then that would be perfection, not what we're calling the perfection of all dharmas. But that's what raises this question of lion courage. How are all Buddha dharmas perfected? That's a great question. 
<laughs> right? The, the Bodhisattva has asked the perfect question because that's what's on my mind, <laughs> having heard what Manjushri said. And now we get the, the deep answer. So Manjushri replies saying, Buddha Dharma are perfect just as Buddha Tathata, as true suchness, is perfect. True suchness, Buddha Tathata, is perfect just like space is perfect. Like this, Buddha Dharma, Buddha Tathata, and akasha are all non-dual. So let's just let's just stop with that. Yeah, because the next part. So this one, let's let's read an alternate translation. To achieve perfection in the Buddha Dharmas is to achieve perfection in suchness, Buddha Tathata. To achieve perfection in suchness is to achieve perfection in empty space. Thus, the Buddha Dharmas, suchness, and empty space are all one and the same. Sounds about right. And just to give you a sense of how the Tibetan one reads, and just to get another angle on this, sorry, the prof, uh, da, da, da. what does it mean, uh, Manjushri, what does it mean to be perfect in the qualities of Buddhahood? So that's how the Tibetans, or the Tibetan translates it. Noble one, the perfection of suchness is perfecting the qualities of Buddhahood. The perfection of space is perfecting the qualities of Buddhahood. Given this, space, the qualities of Buddhahood, and suchness are non-dual and cannot be differentiated. All right. So in general, they're all saying the same thing in that sense. It's this idea that all Buddha Dharma, <laughs> true suchness, and space <laughs> are non-dual, <laughs> are one and the same. So we could, I suppose, at this point, say that they're synonymous in that, in that sense, that they're the same in that. So let's try to figure this out shall we so let me and actually yeah so i'm only gonna define a few terms here i don't i'm basically i just want to talk about this idea of space the sutra goes further of course than this in a very interesting way so i'll let the sutras talk but let's just get clear about what these terms are all about so the idea of space, it's such an important idea in the world of Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy. And so I often talk about space because the Buddha often talks about space. In fact, he often equates things with space. Sometimes the mind is equated to being like space. Sometimes true suchness and Buddha dharmas are being equated to space. So the thing about space that's really important to keep in mind is that when we think about phenomena, you know how I keep talking about all phenomena and I was talking earlier about all phenomena being empty. So when we're talking about phenomena, we're talking about, you know, stuff, of course. And I'm going to use, I want to use my screen back here as an example. I often do. And what it is, is, is that 
you know, traditionally, Buddhism, like India, all like all Indian philosophies, Buddhism often talks about the four great elements: earth, fire, water, and air, that make up physical reality. And then there's space. And the point is, is that space is not something. It's not something at all, at all, at all. It has a relationship to things, but it is not something. And if you want to think about space, space is very interesting because it is literally the space between things. But if we start to look at space, and when I say look at, I suppose I should choose my words carefully. When we start to think about space, the idea is, is that if you want to like, oh, look, there's a little bird. And as soon as I say, look, a little bird, your, your mind, the viewer, the mind, can isolate the little bird. And even though it's part of the painting, the mind can just sort of say, no, 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 just the bird. And when we do that, when we say just the bird, we are, there's now space. There's space like around it. And we could even get into the, the space between the paint and the canvas. But the point is, is that space is sort of everywhere. And it just depends upon what the mind is isolating. And actually, in order to isolate anything, requires space. Now, here are some flowers, right? And the flowers are again, part of the screen. But look, there's now space <laughs> between this and that. And you, the, you no longer think that this is part of the, the, the screen because there's space, right? But there's space between me and the flower, and it's how you don't get me confused with the flower because there's space between us. But I want you to keep thinking about the subtlety of space because if we take something like my hand, there it is again, space, <laughs> space, it's not my face, it's not the screen, it's the hand. And at this point, you might be thinking, oh yeah, space is like, space is like vacuousness. It's like the, the vacuousness between things. Yeah, it's kind of the vacuousness between things, except what about my, my fingers? Oh, look space that allows for you to differentiate the fingers. But what if I said the palm of my hand? There's no vacuous space between my hand or my arm and the palm, but your mind can sort of conceptually lift, lift the palm and just isolate the palm. And now there's space between the fingers and the palm of my hand. But is there any space, like vacuous space? And that's where I wanna to return to the point I made a little moment ago. Space isn't anything. It allows for things. The point is, is that space is not an aspect of the physical world. It's much closer to an aspect of the mental world. 
because it is the mind that needs space to conceive of differentiated objects. So space is super subtle. Again, it's everywhere. And as I, I've given uh, Dharma talks before about different meditative states and the idea of the formless realm of infinite space, that formless jhana of infinite space, it's sort of about realizing that there's as much space here <laughs> as you need. <laughs> because it just goes on and on and on forever. And it's the mind that decides to stop and differentiate objects. But if it didn't stop, if it was unobstructed, it would enter this realm of just infinite space. <laughs> Doesn't it sound cozy and free in the realm of infinite space, right? So that's space. Space is, again, it's subtle, but everywhere, it's allowing for conceptualization, all of these things. And now we are told something about space. We are told using the language of the sutra. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very like focusing on the language. Manjushri tells us that this perfection, this completion, it's perfect like space is perfect. So now we can get a little closer to what Manjushri or the Buddhists or the Buddha means by perfect. I know that this can be a hang up. It was a hang up for me for a while. The language of perfection it's like, it seems like it's so un-Buddhist to like be obsessed with perfection. I'm with you. Again, I, when I kept hearing this language, but now I've kind of come around to understanding exactly what they're talking about. And if we think about space, this, this subtle, interesting dimension of our reality, and if we start to think about it, and Manjushri, the Buddha, is telling us that it is perfect. Well, what makes it perfect? The thing about it is, is that within the realm of differentiation, I just mentioned that space has this really intimate relationship with conceptualizing, like being able to differentiate this from that space, separation between them. So now it's like, oh, okay, if I'm going to bifurcate reality into pieces, it needs space. And then once I've bifurcated reality into pieces, now, of course, I can begin to like certain pieces and not like other pieces, privilege certain pieces over other pieces. In other words, I begin, I can now just really, really, um, be deluded in that sense, in that Buddhist sense of being attached to this and not wanting that. So having all of, you know, having desire, having anger, having all of these things, these de defilements, it requires <laughs> separation. In other words, let's think about something that we would think of as defiled in some in any in a moral sense or even in you know the idea here is is it's beginning to notice that in order to make that judgment upon things they need to be separated in that way but all the while 
space remains unjudgeable because it's that which is then allowing us to make these judgments to begin with. But it itself, because it has no color but allows for color, because it has no scent or flavor but allows for scent or flavor, it itself is perfect in that way that it is, it is unjudgeable, but it allows for judgment in that sense. So space as this utterly allowable aspect in that way, like that, the fact that it, it, and this is where we get tricky. This is where we get into trouble. If we start to think about space as the canvas of reality, we've, we've made it a thing. And as a thing, it can now be judged and all of that. And, and that's, no, oh, we missed it. So we have to keep space as a dimension of conceptualization, but never an actual concept. If we do that, we maintain its purity in that way, its perfection in that way, because it, it's really space. It's not just another object in that way. So everybody follow me on this. We're really just trying to get comfortable with the idea of space and then wait, maybe understand why space is kind of really cool, i.e. perfect. <laughs> Okay, so now we can start to kind of grok gro or vibe on how all Buddha Dharma and suchness or Buddha Tathata and space. So those three are all equal. So in many ways, I have also now, right now, also been describing Buddha Tathata. I have also been describing all Buddha Dharma. <laughs> and I can get away with that because Manjushri told us that those three are non-dual. And so if I were to do dualize them into space and Buddha Tathata, that would be two things, and that would be dual, and then that would not be either space or Buddha Tathata. So now we're kind of okay, those three things are equal, and they display this quality, if you will, of perfection. One more aspect of this word perfect that I should have mentioned. But so this is a little like a, a an even deeper layer of the language that's going on here. So if you read this text in the Chinese, the Chinese have a very interesting word that the Chinese Buddhists used for perf this idea of perfection. And at first, this, is, this might sound a little weird, but in the Chinese, the word that they use for perfection is yuan, and that word means round. It can also mean spherical or just round. And at first, that sort of seems like a, a leap or, huh, how do we get from a circle to perfect? Better yet, I want to remind you of a, of a sphere. And the reason why I mention this is because there's an, an analogy that is used in the Chinese to, for like, why do they use the word round for perfection? And I also want to include in this that a secondary meaning to perfect is complete, not missing anything, total. And the, the example that's often given for 
roundness as perfect, as complete, is a bubble. And I say that because there's this thing that where once a bubble is formed, it, it can't get any more formed as a bubble. <laughs> like it doesn't get more round, more perfectly spherical. It, once it has, once a, some soap has achieved, has achieved the state of being a bubble, it's complete, it's perfect, it's round, it's spherical. But if you think about that, like if you think about how a bubble can't get any more round, that reminds me of Manjushri's answer about how once you're in, enlightened in that way, you, you don't get more enlightened. I hadn't thought about that until this very moment. So this idea of perfection, this idea of thinking of like a bubble and this idea in particular of no more further to go in that way. Yeah, Tanya. Yeah, I was just thinking there's like no beginning and no end to a circle or a sphere. Awesome. So kind of goes with the past, present, future and other stuff Ooh. you were saying too. Ooh, Tanya, <laughs> going esoteric on this. <laughs> Great comment, Tanya, totally. And I don't know, maybe think of those Zen, is it the Zen folks that do the like circle thingy? Is that related to this? The perfection of a circle is definitely in the man mandala, the complexities, whether they are complex mandalas or what I call the Zen mandala, which is just that simple circle. But all of that is pointing to, yes, to this, is this very... Buddhist sense of completion and perf what would it mean to be complete or perfect? Totally, totally. All right, so let's keep going. Again, that was just to make sure that we knew the, the general zone that we were in. So the, and this is, all, this is all part of Manjushri's answer, by the way. First, he says the thing about Buddha Dharma, Buddha Tathata, and space being equivalent and equivalent in their perfection. And then he says, so to the Bodhisattva, noble one, he says, just as you asked about how all Buddha Dharma are perfected, it is like the perfection of form all the way up to the perfection of consciousness. Buddha Dharma is also like this. So in this version, just as a person can achieve perfection in form, feeling, conception, oh, sorry, well, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, so can they achieve perfection in all Buddha Dharmas. And I'll let you know that the Tibetan does the same thing, which is that they fill in the gap. And there's a gap because Manjushri says, you just asked about the perfection of all Buddha Dharma. Well, it's like the perfection of form up to consciousness. And what he is implying is the five skandhas, the aggregate of form, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So he says, yeah, it's like the perfection of form. It's, it's like the perfection of the skandhas, is what he says. And so if, if you're like me, I'm wondering what that means. And of course, our friend Lion Courage, Thunder's voice replies, what does it mean to perfect form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness? What does it mean to perfect the five aggregates? Now, of course, the five aggregates is what we would conceive of as the self. There is no self in that sense, but there's the five aggregates. So, Manjushri answers, noble one, 
What do you think? Whatever forms you see, are they permanent? Are they impermanent? And the Bodhisattva replies, no. And this one, the Bodhisattva asks, what does it mean to achieve perfection in form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness? Manjushri answers, noble one, what do you think? Is the form you see permanent or impermanent? And the Bodhisattva answers, neither. So we're just dealing with the first of the aggregates. So we're dealing with rupa. And important to keep in mind when we're thinking about things in terms of the skandhas, it's always helpful to remember that of the five skandhas, the first one, rupa, the aggregate of form, is the aggregate of physical form. And it is the body, the sense organs, the blood, the pus, the pus, everything is rupa. The other four skandhas, sensations, perception, samskara, conditioning or habits, and then consciousness, those four skandhas are not physical. You could call them mental if you would like, that's kind of pretty standard, but the idea of one aggregate is physical and the other four are what we would call mental. They don't have a physical form. They don't have a, a visual, visible shape or form. They don't have a smell. They don't make a sound. They don't, you cannot touch them. So they are not physical. So the first one that the Manjushri asks about is he says, so what do you think of form? visible objects, are they permanent or are they impermanent? And the Bodhisattva says neither. And that of course is a, a different answer than we might be accustomed to hearing. Because in normal Buddha land, meaning normal Buddhism, we would understand that the, the five skandhas are impermanent, that they're anicca, that they, that, that that's like the teaching of, that's Buddha Dharma. That's the teaching of the Buddha, that they are impermanent in that sense. So visible form here should be impermanent, but this is Bodhisattva, lion courage, thunderous voice. And we're, and I didn't mention this earlier, we're on top of Vulture's Peak. We're like in the most sacred zone of Buddhist sutras with some of the heaviest hitting bodhisattvas. So this is not, you know, your grandfather's Buddhism in that way. This is not the idea about impermanence. So the, the bodhisattva is, is here says that the form is neither permanent nor impermanent. And then Manjushri says, and I'm going to get back to that. I just want to, well, you want you to see where this is going. And then we'll talk about neither permanent nor impermanent. But Manjushri said, says, oh, noble one. If a dharma, meaning if something is neither permanent nor impermanent, is there any increase or decrease? And the Bodhisattva says, no. So let's figure this one out. <laughs> so the, you know, I mentioned this, um, I think, I forget when I would have brought it up. Might've been last week, but so what I brought up at some point during these talks was this classic 
um, a, a classic Buddhist idea that's called the two extreme views. And the two extreme views, and this is something that you hear about in the earliest of Buddhist sutras. In fact, if you read some of the earliest of earliest Buddhist sutras, the Buddha sort of sets his teaching, the, the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha sort of sets his teaching as, on like as special for avoiding the two extreme views. And the two extreme views are usually referred to as eternalism and annihilationism. A lot of modern interpreters, myself included, would call annihilationism nihilism. The modern philosophical trend of nihilism is very close to what the Buddha was talking about regarding annihilationism. But what I mentioned either last week or where, whenever it was, was these ideas of eternalism and annihilationism. It's very interesting because in the early Buddhist texts, the, the main thing that they were talking about, the main thing that some people were saying was permanent and some people were saying was impermanent was the self. So the self, the idea that we have of ourselves, hi, I'm Michael. Is Michael eternal and permanent or is Michael impermanent and falls apart, comes to nihility, comes to nothingness? So what I mentioned in whenever night that was, was that it's kind of a conundrum, that question. Does Michael, do I go on forever? Or do I eventually fall apart? That when the body, when this body falls apart and dies, there just isn't any more Michael. Now, what I may have, I might have asked this the other night, can you think of any other option? It's kind of either got to go on forever or not. <laughs> and that's the, there's our choices. What the Buddha says is that if you go down the road of eternalism, you basically get religion. You get heaven, you get hell, you get this, you get that, you get God, you get a creator, you get da 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 da. And the idea is, is that in order to understand, in order to explain, in order to justify what it would mean for the self to go on forever and ever and ever, well, we got to answer some questions. Where is it that I go on forever and ever and ever? What exactly is it that goes on forever and ever and ever? Because it's not this hair, this hair's fallen out. It's not this body, this body's falling apart. So what is it that goes on forever and ever and ever? And where is this going on forever and ever and ever taking place? <laughs> and you can see how we would start as a, as a culture, as a species, we would start to fabricate ideas about heavens and this and this to explain how it is that the self goes on forever and ever and ever. Because if it's not going on forever and ever and ever, then it's option number two. And option number two has really, really serious implications to thinking that that is the case. What I'm getting at is, is that nihilism, the philosophy that all things come to annihilation and are never to return, 
that that has tremendous moral implications if you really think that all the way through. But there's also some similar philosophical problems in terms of what exactly is it that comes to not be anymore? If the hair that I had as a child has already fallen out, the teeth that I had as a child have fallen out, I have already lost so much of what it, what I thought I was already. What is the essential piece of the puzzle that eventually means I don't exist anymore? And that, of course, has us digging around through the neurons and digging around through all of the molecular biochemical structure of this to try to locate the, the self that goes out of existence. <laughs> So the Buddha said, both of those are just extreme views. They're both too extreme. And the basic idea that the Buddha said, and I'm summarizing greatly, but the teaching was about how there is no self. And when you understand that there is no that self, it avoids the two extremes of what goes on forever and ever and ever, the Buddha is telling us there isn't a self. Well, what dies? There isn't a self. And that avoids the two extreme views in that way. And it is about the confusion of the delusion about there being a self, like just one. <laughs> and it's not this hair and it's not this body, but it's somehow in this body. It's like, yeah, it's that, <laughs> meaning that idea of a self that the Buddha says doesn't exist. But when we think it does exist, we've got to answer those two questions. Does it go on forever and ever and ever, or does it just peter out? And again, what the Buddha did was say, ah, there just isn't a self, and therefore we don't have to wrestle with those two, two extreme views. Instead of a self, the Buddha said in the early teachings, there's the five skandhas. There's the aggregate of form, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. There is no leader of the five skandhas, there's just the five skandhas happening and the five skandhas happening get diluted into thinking that there's somebody there doing that <laughs> rather than the five skandhas just happening in that way. As, as many of you know, if you've been, especially if you've been coming to Dharma doors, but the primary teaching of the Mahayana, which is so well encapsulated in that very beautiful little Heart Sutra, the teaching of the Heart Sutra is that the five skandhas are empty. So not only is there not a self, but even the five aggregates, those two are not existent in that inherent way. Just like we thought there was an inherent self, and then the realization is, wow, there is not an inherent self. It sure seems like there is, but there really, upon really close examination, there just isn't one. In the Mahayana tradition, the close examination was applied to the aggregates themselves. And it was realized, this is why it says the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara realizes that the five skandhas are empty. So the first of those skandhas is physical form. And to say that physical form is empty 
is another way of talking about how physical form is neither permanent nor impermanent. So just like I was saying about the self, if there's a self, then we have to answer that question about whether it's permanent or impermanent. But if we realize there is no self, we don't have to answer that question. <laughs> The Bodhisattva has just said, Manjushri has just said the same thing about form, that form, actually it's the Bodhisattva who said that form is neither permanent nor impermanent. Now at first, that seems, co again, contrary to the early Buddhist teaching. That seems like, well, wait a minute, didn't the Buddha say everything was impermanent in that way? And what this more subtle, teaching of the Mahayana is all about. Let's see. Let's use, let's use this one. I use all these different ones, but this is a classic. This is a classic one in terms of form. So the idea here is, is that <laughs> there's something here in the form of, in the shape of, in the appearance of. And when I, when I often use this example, I often like to use it like my, um, my upaya, my kind of story is that you have two people and there's a knock at the door. And so both people, go to the little keyhole and they both see, they both see this. Now, one person who has a certain body of form, certain eyes and what have you, they assume that this is the object, the two faces, and that this is the space between them. So these are the objects of form, two people's faces, and this is the space in between them that allows me to differentiate the two faces. Now that person pulls back and says, oh, wow, two people. The other person goes to the little keyhole but their eyes, their mind, sees this as space and sees a, a wine or a champagne glass, right? Candlestick, champagne glass, something to that effect. So one person has seen one thing and another person has seen another thing. And at this point, I want to remind you that now these two people are seeing two entirely different forms. One is seeing the form of two faces. The other is seeing the form of a glass or a cup. Now the idea, the, the important Buddhist question to ask is who's right? Now, in the world that we live in normally, where there's like an objective reality, there's a sense that one person's right and one person is wrong. And so there's an, a disagreement and they say, oh, it's two people. No, no, it's a champagne glass. And so in my analogy, because there's a dispute, the two go up and they, they both listen. And the first person who saw two people, they hear, and they say, no, it's two people. I heard them whispering. The other person goes up and listens and hears, and they say, no, that's the champagne bubbles, right? That's the effervescence of the champagne. And of course, you know, they could, uh, poke a hole in the door and reach their hand through, and one person could feel and say, it's their cheek. 
No, it's the side of the glass. So they could see something different, hear something different. They could uh, uh, put their nose under the door and they could say, yeah, I can smell the champagne. I told you it's a champagne glass. And the other person's like, no, they've been drinking. They're just coming from the bar. You're smelling that. So again, the idea here is, is that you, we could think that one is right and one is wrong, or we could be Buddhists and understand that each is having an experience that relates to their conditioning. And neither in that sense is right or wrong. It's just the, the conditions manifesting themselves in that sense. Now, if you followed me on all of that, then, and you really understand that there, I, there isn't two faces or a champagne glass, but if the conditions are appropriate, meaning there's the right mind and this image and what have you, then there can be the perception of two faces or the perception of a glass. If you understand all of that, then let me ask you, does the champagne glass break and get destroyed? Does it, would that champagne glass fall apart? Is that champagne glass impermanent? And if you understand, oh, it's not a champagne glass that like is a real champagne glass. In fact, there's no champagne glass out there. The only champagne glass is an idea in that conditioned mind of the beholder. If you understand it that way, then again, there is no actual form to be permanent or impermanent in that way. Follow me on that. So that's the idea. Now, always really profound, always very interesting to keep in mind. When they're talking about the five aggregates, they're not talking about optical illusions, nor are they even really talking about objects out in space. They're talking about the physical body itself, the physical form body that you think you're walking around in and all of that. And the suggestion here is that that body of form is neither permanent nor impermanent and is ultimately a samskaric generated projection, not unlike these. And the idea is, is, is understanding that, well, in the same exact way that every other person might will view my body differently. Some people might think I'm skinny. Some people might think I'm fat. Some people might think I'm large, tall. Some people might think I'm short. And the realization is, is that those characteristics, the characteristics of being tall or short, big or skinny, handsome or ugly or this or that, meaning having this body of form or that body of form, it's actually going to be different for every single person viewing you. And there's the self-reflexive understanding we have of our own bodies of form, which are just one among that infinitude of impressions. And when we understand that there is no objective fixed body of form. That's the body of form that neither is permanent nor impermanent in that way. And if you, if you get that, then we can talk about it neither increasing nor decreasing, because that was the next part of the Bodhisattva's comment, which is that if a Dharma, if something is neither permanent nor impermanent, then there is, or he asks, is there any increase or decrease? And the Bodhisattva says, no, there's no increase or decrease. 
there's so many ways to think about the idea of increasing or decreasing. It has a lot to it, but I, I only want to give you just one way to think about it, but there are many, many more. But the, when we're referring to the body of form, you could think about it in terms of getting bigger, like growing up, increasing in body mass, increasing in size. And the idea here is, is that if, if you've been following all of the Dharma trail tonight, the idea is, is that if I think that there's a permanent self person called Michael, then I could start to think about Michael getting bigger growing up. Then I could think about Michael disintegrating, decreasing, and going away. So I get the uh, arising and ceasing, which is to say also the increasing and decreasing of the Dharma called Michael. When I think there is that Dharma called Michael, when we understand, ah, no self, then is there, is there a body getting bigger? Is there a body getting smaller? Is there, you know, what exactly are we referring to that is increasing? What exactly are we referring, are we referring to that is decreasing? So there's a through line through all of this, which again is that sort of delusion of the insistence of there being something. And as soon as we insist that there is something, then there's a lot of consequences to that way of thinking. And so, noble one, if a dharma, if something neither increases nor decreases, this is called perfect. What is perfect? If one is unable to understand all dharmas, one then gives rise to differentiation. If one is able to understand all dharmas, then there will not be differentiation. If there is not differentiation, then there is no increase and no decrease. If there's no increasing and no decreasing, then this is equanimity. For this reason, noble one, if one sees form equanimously, this is the perfection of form. Sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, and all other dharmas are also like that. Okay, so that kind of brings, starts to bring this full circle to the things I was saying earlier about space, differentiation. If we differentiate this from that, we can now privilege this over that or want this and not that. So the Bodhisattva here has brought it kind of back to that idea. And then of course, this idea that if there is no increasing or decreasing, this is equanimity. Now, another, and I, th this is a little late for new information, but I want to tell you that the idea of this equanimity, this specific sentence, which is that if there is no increase or decrease, then this is equanimity. The word that's being used for equanimity here is not upeksha. And I, there's, I meant to actually talk about this a few nights ago when I, I did a whole night on upeksha. So upeksha, and I don't want this to digress into a whole talk about upeksha again, but the idea of equanimity or upeksha, upeksha is kind of an, 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 an emotional state. It's an emotional state of kind of that emotional balance where we're very kind of even keeled 
about our wanting and hating in that way. So upeksha is kind of a, again, an emotional thing. But this, where it says, this is equanimity, that this is, the word is actually samata. And that's another word that sounds like a word you might know, which is shamata, shamata, this idea of calming. Those two words are also related, but samata, S-A-M-A-T-A, -A -A, samata, it means sameness, sameness. Like, in, and I often point out that, you know, we get the English word same, S-A-M-E, we get it from Sanskrit, from the S-A-M, sam. So samata is the idea of sameness, equality, equanimity in that way. And so when the Bodhisattva here has said that if there is no increasing or decreasing, then this is samata. This is sameness. This is that equanimity. This will be reminiscent of some ideas um, also from some nights before. But if you were following me, and let me bring back our friends and their glass. So if you were following me regarding this analogy of the two faces or the glass, and in particular, if you were following me when I mentioned how we normally think that there must be a right and a wrong, there must be a truth and not true, uh, existent and non-existent. We normally think that way, but as I walked us through this from the kind of a Buddhist psychological point of view, there's no objective reality where there's absolute truth and absolute falsehood in that sense. There's these kind of subjective experiences and neither is more real than the other in that sense. So in this scenario, we have the one person who is seeing faces and the other person who is seeing a glass. If you understand what I'm saying about not an objective reality where there's it's one, not the other, it's actually this. If you understand it the other way, the Buddhist way, there's a certain equality then to the faces and the glass, meaning they are equally not real. <laughs> they equally both have an empty nature. And so that is the first thing I want to point out. They are both not really real like that, meaning objectively real like that. So that's the first thing. And so therefore they don't have svabhava, they don't have inherent nature, and therefore they are empty. And that's the emptying of all phenomena I was talking about at the, at the beginning of the talk. The emptying of all phenomena of its perceived inherent nature. So we empty everything out and then that puts everything on a very equal playing field as a kind of empty, well, like the Buddha said, like a phantom, like an illusion, like a bubble, like a dream. These ideas of it being seemingly what it is, but not svabhava, not inherently what it is. So now what I can drop on you in the next few minutes, it's this idea of, let's say, let's say I took some acid. <laughs> let's say I took a hallucinogen and all of a sudden, I started seeing these uh, balloons, these multicolored balloons floating around. And I was like, whoa, you guys see those balloons? And you're all, all of you are like, no, we, we don't see the balloons that you're talking about, right? So 
in the normal way of thinking, Michael's crazy, tripping, and there are no balloons. Everybody in, in the audience here who is not seeing balloons, they're in accord with reality because in reality, there's no balloons. Michael is not, I'm not in accord with reality. This is what we would think, right? That there aren't really balloons and that everybody who is not seeing them is in accord with reality. From what we just talked about though, you all haven't done enough acid is the problem, really. I'm just kidding, by the way, that was a joke, seriously. My point is, is that had you, you might see the balloons too. So the idea is, is that the balloons that I'm seeing, it's not that they're real, like really real balloons, but it's really an experience that I'm having. <laughs> like it really is a hallucination. You could put it that way in that sense. But so the idea is, is that it's not that you all are right and there's no balloons, nor is it that I'm right and there are balloons, but you all can't see them. It's just that for you, the conditions of your mind that are lysergic acid lists or whatever, right? They don't see the balloons and mine does. And that's exactly like I was talking about with my optical illusion in that way. So here's what we could say. Here's what we could say about those balloons, that they are such, that they are thus. Are they existent? Are they non-existent? Are they permanent? Are they impermanent? Well, no, because they don't exist like that. They don't exist in a way to be permanent or impermanent. They don't exist in a way to be real or not real, but they are thus. And that thusness, that suchness, that as it isness, that's the, when we return after the emptying process of understanding the empty nature of all things, when we return to the world of phenomena, of perceived phenomena, with an understanding of perceived phenomena's empty nature, we understand that it is such, it is thus in that way. And what we could then say about that, what the sutra says about that, is that it is then perfect, complete. There's nowhere else to go. There's, it doesn't get more rounder than this. The body of form doesn't get more empty than this in that way. All right, everybody, all that. Yeah, Tanya. So you, but you have to be very careful not to make thusness or suchness or emptiness or equanimity into like a lakshana, into a characteristic, right? Like it's, you just kind of hold it like, yeah, lightly, right? Oh, you just said something very interesting. You actually do turn Buddha Tathata into a characteristic. And what I mean by that is in the Vajra Sutra, in many Mahayana Sutras, they talk about the Buddha Tathata Lakshana. And the Buddha Tathata Lakshana is that one flavor of all phenomena, that one shared characteristic of all phenomena is that they are such, undeniably such. But, but it's in a way that doesn't make it into a one thing, because as soon as you make one thing, you have two, and then you got the whole shebang, right? You're, so you're back into reified uh, existence land. So you, so it's a, it's a kind of a lakshana, but it's a different kind of lakshana, right? 
I mean, profound, it's like profound, Tanya, profound. Yes, in fact, there's entire sutras written about this very idea where bodhisattvas ask the Buddha, is the Buddha Tathata Lakshana a Lakshana? Like, is it a characteristic like a regular characteristic? And what the Buddha says is, it's neither the same as a regular characteristic, nor is it different <laughs> than regular characteristics. Of and, course. <laughs> and even though that sounds like a cop out, it's not. No, 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 no. I'm, and I meant that like in a funny way, but go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Noe, did you have a. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> And the mind scatters. <laughs> the the idea. Uh, so we ta once talked about the you know the forest, uh, th those that meditate in the forest, and then go into the different levels of meditation, to 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 consciousness, non consciousness, to nothingness, emptiness, and then, and then they come back. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so is this the in in this suchness? in the practice. So I want to talk about the practice is the practice is similar to what you're talking about in a way that I, you know, I, I'm looking at it, I'm seeing the two faces, I'm seeing the goblet, then I see nothing at all. And uh, mm -hmm. there's this moment or not of, of equanimity. It's like, oh, oh, what is, that? and then but as soon as I say, what is that? I'm back in the forest. <laughs> Let me, I'll give you a, because uh, you ask about practice, it, kind of a very practical way of how to apply this. So one really simple example I'll give you, it's the idea of, well, it has to, it has so much to do with something I've been saying all night and, or it, throughout, which is this idea about judgment. And this idea about judging and therefore then privileging and therefore getting in all involved in this mess. And when we see things as being such, as thus, and I wanna remind you too, as an element of practice, and this goes to Tanya's comments a little bit too, by the way, it's very important to remember that this idea of suchness or thusness, tathata, it's not, and it could be, but this would be the wrong thing that Tanya was pointing out. It's not an abstract idea that exists somewhere else. This, this moment right now that we're sharing together, that you're having, looking at me or hearing me, this is the Tathata they're talking about. Meaning there's nowhere else for Tathata to be, but in the present moment. And so it's about really sinking into this present moment in that way, as Buddhism is often always trying to get us to do, right? To be here now in that way. So I hope that helps, Noe. Oh, good. All right, everybody, there is more, but we will pause there and wait to see. So. Uh, unless there's any last minute questions or comments or answers or ideas. Awesome. Great night, everybody. Really a lot of great, beautiful ideas. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Tanya? Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Awesome and mind bending as, as always. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>